today's podcast, some guidelines to completing EEO affidavits for federal employees is a very important topic. Uh, I must get 200 questions a year on this topic. What is the best way to fill out my EEO affidavit? Being harassed here, and that's what it's coming to, actually, with some of these EEO investigators. I am now seeing EEO investigation affidavits with over 400 questions. That can take a federal employee a week to complete if that person doesn't have certain guidelines on how to complete them. And of course, if you don't complete them on time or you don't supply enough information, the court can dismiss your case. The court can say you didn't cooperate with the EEO investigator. Obviously, these guidelines are not meant to be actual legal advice for anyone's case in particular. If you have a particular question on your specific affidavit, you should contact our office. We do many of these and we can help you. However, before you make that call, there are some things just that are guidelining that are really important for people to complete and can make this process a lot smoother, a lot less time consuming, a lot more efficient, and can ultimately raise the value of your case. You will see on these EEO affidavits one question that shows up with every single discriminatory adverse action you're complaining about, and it is the following. Why do you believe? I love this question. Why do you believe that such and such was discrimination? Why do you believe that? Now, first, I think it's important to understand this. What the plaintiff, the person who's suing for discrimination, what he or she actually believes as the reason can be relevant, but it may be irrelevant. There might be things that the plaintiff doesn't even know about. Someone may have a reasonable suspicion, which by the way, you have to have in order to bring one of these cases, and you only have 45 days from when you have that reasonable suspicion of discrimination to contact an EEO counselor. So just putting that aside, I mean, the question itself isn't even, isn't even fair because I don't have to believe that X, Y, and Z was discrimination. All I have to believe is that I had a reasonable suspicion of it. In attacking that question, I think that a lot of people, they do one of two things that are wrong. Either they only put down one claim. They say something like gender, which is a mistake, or they put down every basis of discrimination race, gender, national origin, age, disability, that's a mistake. Because generally people, first, first I'll talk about why only putting one basis is a mistake. And then I'll, I'll cover the reason that all of them is a mistake also. Every claim, I believe, almost every time, someone should have a retaliation claim built into their case. And the reason for that is from the moment you contact an EEO counselor and the agency is aware of that, many, many times additional acts of retaliation occur. So by the time you're filling out this affidavit, there might've already been three or four other things that happened to you. So you want to include that basis just about every single time you have an EEO case. And one thing you almost never want to claim is age discrimination unless you were terminated, suspended, major reduction in duties. Uh, age discrimination cases based on hostile work environment almost always lose. And the problem with them is against the government, you don't get your attorney fees reimbursed at the administrative level. You don't get a jury trial on age claims against the government in federal court. 
and you don't get compensatory damages for age discrimination claims for pain and suffering. So someone says, I went through a hostile environment on an age claim that's actually taking away from some other claim, some gender claim. If the case is more suited for that, especially at this level, you want to say that. So you want to say why I believe such and such was discrimination. You want to list the facts. You want to list why you were treated differently than somebody else outside of your protected group. That's the key to that question. You also want to say in the answer, a lot of the facts here are not yet known. Next issue or next grouping of cases or next grouping of questions, I should say. I love this one. Cite the law or the policy that you believe the agency violated. I, I saw this recently on an EEO affidavit at least eight times. I told my client to simply say the following in response. Here's the answer. Last time I checked, it was illegal to discriminate against someone because of their disability or race, national origin or gender. I'm not aware that this agency is now disputing that and requiring the complainant to cite a law policy or something else that the agency violated. Very simply, it's like, Mr. Investigator, what the hell are you asking my guy to do? What do you mean, cite the law? This guy's not a lawyer. He doesn't have to cite the law. It's, it's illegal to discriminate. That's the law. Next question. I get these a lot. Hey, there's a question. Did I appeal whatever it was that I'm complaining about? The question there is asking for a Merit Systems Protection Board appeal or a grievance appeal. And for federal employees who are represented by unions, you already know that in the vast majority of union contracts, you can either file with the EEO office or your union, you cannot do both. That's kind of what they're talking about. So, you know, it, it just, I got a reassignment or something and they took away all of my duties and I appealed to the second level supervisor and said, hey, this is discrimination. That's not the appeal they're talking about. Another set of questions that come up has to do with the causes of whatever happened to you. So why were you suspended? Okay. Why did you get reprimanded? Whatever the case may be. If you believe that the issue could have been also because you blew the whistle on something, you can say that. You can say, I believe that it was the, the reasons were A, I complained about illegal hiring for this promotion, which is a whistleblower claim. And I also believe that it was discrimination. And I have a whistleblower claim right now with the Office of Special Counsel. And on my whistleblower claim, I did not say it was discrimination because if you do that, the OSC will immediately dismiss your claim and say that, oh, you belong in the EEO world. So those are tricky when you file in both places. We do those for complainants. They, they are tricky, but if you can do them well, you will generally double your chances of winning on legitimate claims. So that is perfectly okay. In fact, I, I would talk about the different reasons, even if they're not discrimination. Certainly, if they're whistleblowing, you want to talk about them because this will show up in your whistleblowing case. Another issue, similarly situated employees. This is the number one reason the EEO administrative judges or EEOC administrative judges are dismissing cases. Hey, we got your ROI. There was no talk of similarly situated employees. Most of the time, the investigator didn't ask that question. Who do you believe you're treated differently from and why? You have to say that. Otherwise, you will face a sua sponte or a motion from the court immediately to get rid of your case. Somewhere in your EEO affidavit, 
you should be naming your coworkers who didn't get treated in the same manner that you did. If there is no similarly situated employee question, you include that information. Really, really important. And by the way, what the government always tries to do is take whomever you've cited as a similarly situated employee and say, well, that person's not really similarly situated. In fact, there was a case in the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals years back, two people were on an assembly line and one guy was like banging in a nail and then the other guy was like tightening it or it was a screw or two people virtually on the same, they, they were on the same assembly line, just along the different jobs of the assembly line. And the court said, well, is that similarly situated? Well, we don't think so. Right? Now there's been many cases after that, which have kind of taken the sting out of that. And certainly in the EEOC world, they don't view it that way. On harassment cases, all you kind of need are people under the same policy. It, whether some guy was uh, a doctor and another person was simply um, a technician and they're both sexually harassed, okay, and one they do something about, one they don't, all right, we don't simply say, well, because he's a doctor, he's not subject to sexual harassment, he can be sexually harassed because he's a doctor. And you're just a technician, so you have to take it. I mean, that, that's not the law. I mean, it, it, obviously, if it's a harassment case, similarly situated person could be anybody at the company the, uh, or at the organization or the agency. So that's really important. Compensatory damages. I get these questions all the time. What should I put down? And I see things like, I want to retire with full pension. Right? The government is never going to do that. I would like those to be held accountable. They're never going to do that. They're asking essentially, how much money are you looking to settle this case? Recently, I've been telling people, put down the maximum, $300,000. Although it's the highest award, the cap hasn't been changed in many, many years. Inflation, as I do this podcast, it's at runaway numbers. So that $300,000 might really only be $200,000. And in five years, the way things are going, by the time the lawsuit's done, it might only be worth $25,000. So put down the maximum for now. And then you also want to put down, I want all my doctor and therapy bills covered, prescription drugs, things like I want my rating raised if you had a bad rating. I want my original duties I had per the position description, not some additional description that is haphazardly made up by my supervisor who's trying to get rid of me. Those are the things that lend a lot of legitimacy to your EEO complaint. And again, these are just the guidelines. If you have individual cases, individual questions, you should get representation. Uh, this is a key aspect. It has become an imperative aspect of EEOC administrative cases, because if these affidavits are not filled out correctly, the administrative judge, before he even meets you, is going to file a motion to get rid of your case, and those are becoming harder to win. They're not harder to win on appeal, but they're harder to win on the initial motion, because think of it this way, the administrative judge has pretty much already made up his or her mind. And the first impression is really important. So you want a first impression case that has all the elements that support your claim and give you the best chance of winning. If you have been discriminated against at work, at a federal agency, or retaliated against, call us. We can help you.